Surprise! <laughs> it's closer than ever to Halloween, and everyone's entitled to one good trick. That's right, we've got more of the Ghost Rider manuscripts as part of this year's SCP Vault. To be perfectly honest, part of the good in having the Ghost Rider works for SCP Vault is that I've experienced difficulties of time allotment this season, and was convinced for a while that our initial foray was all the time we would get, and all I could truly do. But, with the way things worked out, I found myself with the time to visit just a few more I had on my list. Of course, this is a continuation of SCP Vault 8, so if you haven't seen that, there's nearly an hour and a half of terrifying tales from the Foundation in it for you, as well as an explanation of exactly what it is we're doing here. And if you've already heard those, welcome to the After Hours Haunting. Here's to getting luckier than expected this October. So, are you ready to journey back into the darker stories of the Spectral? This manuscript from the Ghostwriter material is a straightforward short story describing SCP-3182, a dilapidated grocery store in the town of Denton, Missouri. Every night, from 7.52 through 8.52, anomalous properties manifest within the building. This activity has occurred since the store's initial closure several years ago. According to the Foundation Brief, Said closure took place due to the combination of an ongoing poor economic situation in the town and negative publicity brought about by the self-inflicted passing of a 17-year-old part-time worker. The anomalous period is labeled as a Dimos event. During this event, no outside sources of visible light are able to penetrate SCP-3182. Additionally, individuals will find themselves unable to enter or exit the building, claiming when questioned that no entrances or exits exist. Video recordings of their time around SCP-3182 show that this is not the case, suggesting SCP-3182 instead has an effect on the perceptions of those that came in contact with it. Individuals present inside SCP-3182 during a Dimos event are known to be anomalously affected in a number of ways, including sudden and irregular bouts of extreme distress or melancholy, Development of severe resentment towards the town of Denton, Missouri. Recollection of memories determined to belong to former regular customers at 3182. Paranoia regarding a vague approaching danger and a need to do something about it. And a strong desire to leave SCP-3182, even though this is not possible. A number of adverse physical effects, including nausea, severe injuries, and death, have also been recorded. The anomalous effects of 3182 appear to be centered around aisle 3 of the store. In this area, along with the previously mentioned phenomena, manifestations including disembodied moaning and screaming, the appearance of indistinct humanoid figures, and the sounds of something heavy being dragged along the floor have been reported. The first exploration of the grocery store was conducted by Dr. Gradian using a member of D-Class, number 132. They were ordered to remain within the former break room of the store for the duration of the Dimos event, equipped with a camera and an earpiece. So, they said after seating themselves. One hour, right? Just sat here? That's all? That's all, Dr. Gradian confirmed. D-132 laughed, saying it was the easiest test they'd ever done. Dr. Gradian reminded the D-Class to keep researchers informed about any mental effects experienced. Seven minutes and 32 seconds passed, suddenly broken by D-132 muttering, Fuck. Yes? What is it? Dr. Gradian asked. D-132 confessed that they just remembered that after the test, they would have to return to their cell. They commented that the environment did seem to be getting to them. Another 22 minutes and 19 seconds passed, almost halfway through the Dimos event. D-132 asked, do you hear that? I don't hear anything, Dr. Gradian answered. What do you mean? That, right there, 132 replied. I can just hear something. Hold on, it's... it's over here. D-132 got up from the chair and moved across the break room towards a broken microwave on a nearby table. Soft gurgling was heard coming from inside the closed microwave. There. Do you hear it now? 132 asked. 
There's something in there. Dr. Gradian recommended not engaging with the microwave. D-132 responded that they weren't about to sit for another 30 minutes wondering what was going on with the nasty fucking microwave. At this, the gurgling sounds intensified. Dr. Gradian urged 132 to back away. 132 ignored the instruction and opened the door. The video feed immediately cuts. After the Dimos events, a task force found the microwave open in the break room, filled with a viscous black liquid. It was extracted for study, and during analysis, found to be genetically identical to several hundred past and current residents of Denton. D-132's remains were later discovered distributed throughout the store's plumbing system. The next exploration involved D-342. Dr. Gradian warned him to avoid any gurgling sounds, then instructed the D-Class to proceed from the break room to aisle 3. Halfway there, he stopped to observe a message carved into the wall above the main entrance. Get out of here right now. Easier said than done, D-342 remarked. When Dr. Gradian questioned the comments, 342 explained there were no doors in the building. It didn't matter that 342 had come in through doors. They claimed there was no longer an exit suddenly. Dr. Grady had dropped the line of questioning and instructed 342 to continue to aisle 3, asking about his mental state. 342 was in the middle of saying that despite the environment being scary, they were fine. When they again stopped, this time at one end of aisle 3. At the other end stood a female humanoid figure in a shirt and jeans. Facial features were indistinct, shifting between a normal human face and various abnormal configurations. The entity appeared to be missing all fingers. Researchers hereafter referred to her as SCP-3182-1. 342 immediately rejected the idea of any action going forward. He fumbled with a shelf next to him, presumably looking for a weapon and settling for a cardboard box. 3182-1 rapidly shook its head with a panicked expression on its face. It opened its mouth, and the overlapping sounds of numerous cash registers operating was heard. This appeared to cause it some level of frustration. Dr. Gradient tried to calm D-342, who swore back and, despite not knowing where the test was taking place, said, I'm not dying in this goddamn town. He threw the box at 3182-1. A gurgling sound came from behind him, and the camera feed cut. According to the report, D-342 was found after the Dymos event in a dumpster in the alley outside the store, still alive, but missing most of his epidermis and musculature, which had been strewn across the inside of the store. The final exploration log was conducted with D-693. They were instructed to stay in aisle 3 for the duration of the Dymos event. Immediate reports were that 693 felt cold, really cold. I'm sure it will pass, Dr. Gradian said. Try to think positively. You come out here to the ghost of Walmart and try to think positively, 693 answered. Dr. Gradian apologized, but still recommended remaining calm. There was a moment of silence, suddenly broken by 693 claiming she couldn't stay. She really needed to get out. I can't be stuck here, she stated. I need to get out of here right now. D-693 turned to leave, then caught sight of SCP-3182-1 at the other end of aisle 3. Her heart rate immediately spiked, and protests at the situation began in earnest. Dr. Gradian informed 693 that the entity wouldn't allow her to leave. I, I can't. I just... I need to get out of here right now, 693 insisted. I need to get out of here right now, or I'll end up like her. When Dr. Gradian asked what she meant... 693 couldn't answer except to share that it felt like words were being shoved into her mouth. A soft gurgling was heard as they moved to the entrance of the store. Dr. Gradian requested that 693 look back at the entity, the ghost, and got a new visual. 3182 shaking its head with a panicked expression on its face, the floor beneath it shifting and moving in the manner of a liquid. Numerous human arms emerged beneath 3182 grabbed it, and began dragging it downward. As it sank, it frantically gestured towards the exit, screaming loudly until, at last, it disappeared. The floor shifted back into a solid state, and the gurgling sound ceased. 
In a panicked state, D-693 ran around the store, repeating the same phrase over and over. I need to get out of here right now. She did not respond to any attempts to communicate until the Daimos event concluded. The final log is a list of attempts to speak with the entity present inside SCP-3182 using a D-Class member. Initially, responses were in line with replies from an employee of a grocery store, though mixed with multiple voices. The responses quickly changed. When asked what the entity looked like, at least seven voices answered in unison, saying, Look at me. This place has ruined me. I should have moved to Jefferson when I had the chance. The D-Class asked where the entity was. At least 25 voices replied, One day I'll have enough money. I'll get out of this place. The next two questions received responses too unintelligible to discern. Then, a single female voice said, You need to get out of here right now. Please get out of here. Her voice became strained at the end, as if being choked off. Hello? The D-Class asked, twice. Then, a recurrence of a previous anomaly, as they suddenly said, I don't want to die in this goddamn town. An estimated 10,000 voices laughed, shaking the grocery store. The following manuscript is the shortest of the collection, and written in a starkly different fashion than the rest. Like a dark fairy tale, as opposed to the more modern style of the other ghostwriter pieces. At its heart is SCP-3998, and it's been titled, The Wicker Witch. SCP-3998 is a human cadaver which expired late 17th century, lacking legs and covered in extensive 4th degree burns. Sometime after its death, 3998's remains were collected and fashioned into a scarecrow, held together by wicker, nails, and wire. Along with its severe burns, 3998 appears to have suffered blunt force trauma to multiple regions of its body. It is unclear which injuries resulted in death, if not both. The object constantly exudes a flammable liquid from its bones, composed primarily of ethanol and human fat. Each night, between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., SCP-3998 ignites and is engulfed in flames, but suffers no structural damage. While on fire, if 3998 is not contained properly, the nearest person who has killed or physically abused a romantic partner will spontaneously ignite. If 3998 is unable to ignite itself, those who would have been targeted only develop brief, mild pains to either their chest or the back of their head. As targets are left burning, large quantities of boiling ethanol will appear in their stomach. This typically induces vomiting, causing further external burns, and often permanent nerve and organ damage if the target survives. Eventually, their body fat, particularly in the torso, will begin to melt. The process is extremely rapid, often causing massive internal damage if the target is successfully extinguished before they die of fourth-degree burns. If left to burn, the combination of melted fat and ethanol will violently rupture the stomach, often bisecting the victim in the process. Those affected by SCP-3998 cannot be extinguished until 3998 itself is extinguished. Following containment, there was a noted increase in the number of murders per day in Massachusetts, increasing from 0.32 to 0.48. A large portion of these deaths were arson homicides, and the victims known perpetrators of violent crimes. They appeared covered in extensive fourth-degree burns, gutted from chest to pelvis. Information on these murders could not be contained due to the corpses being discovered in public displays. The public was led to believe the perpetrator of these killings was a serial killer using the Wicker Witch legend as an inspiration that the Wicker Witch is fictional, and that no witch burnings happened in Salem. Additional information from the Foundation comes in the form of several items discovered related to the anomaly. Item 1 is a collection of excerpts from journals kept by a resident of Salem Village during the 17th century, suggesting a connection between SCP-3998 and a person of interest, Candace Hayes. The author notes that at her wedding, Candace seemed rather distraught, a shame, considering her father had gone through such trouble to see her married to the respectable Aiden Hayes. In short time, it came to be seen that Candace was wearing her hair long and had visible bruises. 
she often looked for excuses to be alone, journeying into the forest. The wives began to gossip that the bruises were a result of being a bad wife, and it eventually came to suspicions that her interests were not even with men. In the wake of spotting Candace heading off into the woods following this rumor, the author concluded the devil must have hold of her, and informed the husband, Aiden. The next item is a court record from June 8, 1963, in which Judge William Stoughton interrogated Goody Hayes about her attempt to avoid an arrest. She informed the court that she had no words in her own defense. She was a witch, and consorted with a spirit, though she said, she is not evil in heart. When asked why she had done this, Candace replied, Is it not obvious? I did not ask to marry, yet I was waved to a bastard in my father's church. He does not respect me. To him I am his property. How could I be faithful to a man I detest? I care only for Clovis, and I'll be damned if I am with anyone but her. It'd be my dying wish to see that bastard on his knees, and treated as I have. Clovis, the judge repeated. Is that the name of the devil that you conjured? It bewitched you. She bewitched me, Hayes agreed, but not in the manner you think. Judge Stoughton, appalled, accepted her confession and declared that, for a witch as brazen as she, the ordinary punishment would not suffice. Instead, she would be burned at the stake, to which Candace Hayes said, so be it. The next item is simple, a declaration of the execution of Candace Hayes two days later, tried and found guilty as a willful consort of Satan. The next item is a letter, found unopened in the cellar of an estate. Dear Candace, if you are reading this, something has gone wrong. You must be angry, confused, maybe depressed. You've given your soul to me when you were young, and we've been together since. But now that you have died, this means your soul is supposed to be mine now. But I don't want it. I want you. I'm sorry we were caught. I'm sorry for what was done to you over the years. I'm still here for you, even if I'm not here with you. So I've brought you back. They put you to the pyre, but I only needed the bones to make you yourself again. I had to remove your flesh, and I couldn't save your legs. They were too far gone. I may do with what was around me. I raped from the field and wrapped your bones in wicker. You'll have to find a replacement. Speaking of, your husband restocked the shelf with gin, and while you are flammable, fire will only make you stronger this time. You won't be hurt from it ever again. You have the power to make him feel worse than what you felt. Just a thought. Make him wish he could go to hell. I love you, and farewell, Clovis. The item that follows is an excerpt from an urban legend website regarding the Wicker Witch. There was once a young woman who was wed to a man against her will. She hated the man, but obeyed her father's wishes for her to bear children for his church. An evil spirit saw this, and came to her while she was out gathering in the woods. The succubus took her hand and told her, I can help you live the life you truly wish to live. You need only to toss this one aside in exchange. Will you take my soul? The woman asked. Yes, said the she-devil. Will I be rich? The woman asked. You shall have power that money could not hope to provide, the spirit told her. Will I have a real love? The woman asked. The spirit paused. I do not know. The woman pondered the offer and asked one more time, What shall you do with my soul? This surprised the devil, but it kept its composure. It told her, It will be consumed. Nothing more, nothing less. The woman accepted and met with the spirit every day for ten years and grew close. She brought the spirit berries and trinkets and it brought her advice and its companionship. It answered her questions and taught her its magics. The woman became a witch, and she used her power to torment her husband the same way he tormented her. One day, her husband followed her and found her shaking the devil's tail. He quietly went back to the town and gathered up a mob. They tied her to a stake, broke her legs, 
and hung her up like a scarecrow to burn. They dumped her body down the mountain, but the devil found her to give back her soul. It wrapped her bones in reeds and used the fire of her soul to keep her alive, but the fire consumed her and she wanted her old husband to burn with her. In the middle of the night, she doused herself in her old husband's gin and set herself ablaze once again. She dragged her husband out of bed and fell upon him. She burned his face and with her thumb dug his eyes out of his skull. She burned with him till his flesh melted to the floor and the smell could be found all across Salem. She grabbed his legs and pulled and pulled till they came loose so that she could use them to walk again. Only one of them walked out of that burning house, and it was her. His body was never found. Some say that the husband futilely crawled out of the wreckage looking for his missing legs. Others say the witch took his body elsewhere so that she could continue to torture him. But many more say that he's in a hell of the witch's own creation, burning over and over again, and bringing those like him down with him, punishing them forever. As for the witch herself, only one thing can be said for sure. The Wicker Witch lives. There is one final item in this brief. A medical report conducted at Site 34 on SCP-3998. Their conclusion was that the human remains had belonged to a man. This tale, strangely, has no working title. But evidence of erasure marks show there used to be one. At its center is SCP-6305, described by the Foundation as a series of spectral manifestations that have been occurring at Washington Middle School since the summer of 2012. These phenomena are confirmed to be related to the death of former student Aaron Fisher, who was nine years old at the time of his passing. An exploration log exists from recordings collected by the initial containment team. Agents Leah Freeman, Deanne Hedge, and Harmony Brown. For the first exploration, Freeman took points, spraying the hallways with warding salts. The wooden floor was severely withered, the boards rotting with mold consumption. Paint on the walls had eroded, revealing dilapidated concrete. Fluorescent lights were suspended from the ceiling via cables, which Freeman maneuvered around to avoid collision. The team noted that all doors containing windows had been shattered, Freeman led her team to the principal's office, spraying warding salts along the room's perimeter upon entry. The principal's desk sat overturned, its contents spilled across the floor. In the corner, two partially decomposed skeletons resulted in a position suggesting an embrace. The angle of both necks suggested the cause of death was a compressed carotid artery in both subjects. Above the bodies, an unknown substance had been spread forming a message. The Liars. A crash came outside the office, drawing the attention of the team. Sounded like metal on metal, Hitch said. Probably a wandering spirit knocking into a locker or something, Freeman replied. Hedge looked through the door, trying to get a visual. Didn't sound like any locker I've heard before, Chief. The rest of the team joined Hedge in the corridor. They progressed toward the library, the air gradually becoming more clouded and worsening as they got closer coaxing occasional coughing fits from the team. After a short period of walking, the path became obstructed by an unseen force. Freeman pointed her flashlight at the obstruction, a mass of tangled rope woven like a spider web. Tangled in the center was an adolescent female cadaver with missing lips. Wounds on the surrounding dermal tissue suggested they'd been torn off. A noise came from above. Three flashlights pointed upward illuminating an insectoid limb poking through a hole in the ceiling. It removed the nearest panel, making a larger opening for a tendril-like appendage bearing a human face to descend. It maneuvered to the cadaver in the web, making clicking noises with its mouth. It did not take notice of the team, focusing only on the cadaver as it began to eat the flesh of its face. The cadaver's left hand spasmed in response, though it was unclear if this was the conscious movement of a still-living individual or an anomalous sight. A loud crack suddenly came from the cadaver, causing Brown to gasp. The tendril ceased activity and shrieked in surprise, temporarily disabling the audio feed and making the team recoil. The face disappeared into the ceiling and the cadaver dropped from the webbing, 
its head rolling away as the body struck the floor. The cadaver spasmed, and tearing sounds echoed in the hall as a swarm of black widows emerged from the gaping throats. The spiders scattered into cracks in the floor and walls, disappearing almost as quickly as they'd arrived. Freeman led the team in the opposite direction, crossing two additional corridors with minimal anomalous activity. As they turned down the third corridor, a red slurry was spotted coating the floors and walls. Mixed into the substance were clusters of unhatched spider eggs and several human mouths. In the walls, the faces of several Washington Middle School teachers could be identified, their expressions ranging from agony to utter dismay. Agent Brown sprayed them with warding salts, causing the faces to contort and express agitation, the eyes rolling backward until only the sclera was visible. Bones within the jaws broke and reformed rapidly, allowing extension beyond human limitation. Brown expressed audible shock. Freeman moved quickly to calm her. The video feed cuts. Immediately after this, the record reads, Despite Foundation paramedical efforts, the faces of Brown, Hedge, and Freeman could not be recovered from within the walls of Washington Mill School. Deanne Hedge, who survived through currently unknown methods, was taken to Site 83 to give her account of the events discovered in the initial exploration log. The interview was conducted by senior researcher Amir Nassar following extensive psychological evaluation to ensure Hedge was of sound mind. Special facial recognition software was able to confirm Hedge's identity through the underlying musculature and bone structure. It was programmed to continue scanning through Foundation medical bandages during the interview process. Researcher Nassar asked Hedge how she was doing. Hedge confessed she'd been in hotspots before, but never came so close to dying. Nassar made a confession of his own in return. He'd been to Washington Mill School as a child, making the entire matter strangely nostalgic for him. Hedge asked about the presence of the facial scanner, a matter Nassar dressed briefly before asking how she survived the events that killed her teammates. She said it was because she got lucky. She made eye contact with the thing in the school and could see his pain. Those kids, they didn't do anything wrong, but that's... It's not how he felt, she said. Nassar asked if by he, she meant the anomalous arachnid. Hedge confirmed, then said his name was Aaron. Please, use his name, she requested. Hedge was asked for more of her observations, but didn't know what else to tell, except that she saw his face, and the face of his classmates, his teachers, and everyone else who wasn't there for him. They were writhing in agony, lips torn from their mouths spiders pouring out of their noses and eyes. They got what they deserved, she said. I am certain of that. The comment was a stark contrast to what she had said just moments before. Researcher Nassar checked the facial identification scanner. It gave a positive reading. He continued the interview, asking Hedge what made her so sure those innocent people received some kind of divine justice. She laughed. Innocent? If you had seen what they had done to me, to Aaron, you wouldn't be so quick to take their side. I can still hear them, whispering in the hallways, behind closed doors, around corners, places where they think I can't hear them. I know they're talking about me, laughing at me. They can pretend all they want, but they can't fool me. Nassar asked if Hedge was suggesting Aaron Fisher experienced paranoia prior to becoming a spectral entity. Hedge replied that paranoia was a cruel word. The facial recognition software indicated that Hedge was not in the Foundation database. Nassar asked her to cite her Foundation identification number, which she did, then became hostile in tone, asking if he thought she was a liar. The facial recognition changed from yellow status to red. Nassar called security, but the doors did not open. Armed personnel appeared on the other side, but were unable to access the interview chamber. Hedge began to shout that she couldn't trust anyone, that Nassar was just like the rest of them. The bones in her neck shattered with a series of audible cracks, and her head rotated 90 degrees. Nassar retreated to the door and attempted to pry it open. A rope descended from the ceiling, coiling around itself to form a hangman's noose. It fell over Hedge's head, pulled the slack and raised her two meters off the ground. You can't help them now, can you? She asked. It's too late. 
The dermal tissue around Hitch's lips began to stretch, then tear. Her eyes glossed over and rolled to the back of her head, exposing the sclera. Hitch's jaw contorted and dropped until it passed her knees. The sire's screams were barely audible as an adolescent male's voice overpowered the room, echoing out from Hedge's gaping jaw, screaming about remembering the play, how they made fun of him, how they kept talking behind his back. Finally, the security team entered the room with the application of a foundation-grade welder. Nassar was still alive, cowering in the corner. Hedge, now deceased, was cut down from the rope. Nassar asked his superiors to be transferred to another project, but in light of recognizing his familiarity with Aaron Fisher following this interview, the request was denied. An exploration of the school was authorized using a member of D-Class, number 1623, who was armed with rubber bullets and warding salt. Nassar was on the radio to guide her through the school. D-1623 had a unique experience compared to the initial containment team. Several spectral events occurred, playing out scenes from the past that she quickly guessed were memories. The first featured Aaron Fisher in a science class, crouching behind a textbook at the back, wearing his hood over his head and shrinking in response to questions from the teacher. At the end of the scene, several ropes appeared in the room. In the library, a new scene. Aaron Fisher hiding behind a novel while another pair of students laughed at a nearby table, playing with a paper triangle. D-1623 witnessed Aaron suddenly getting upset, confronting the pair, and only seeming to cause them confusion. One student pulled out a chair for him to sit, but Fisher stormed off to another area of the library. 1623 followed, finding Fisher's ghost in a corner of the library, quietly crying while observing a spider. He let it crawl onto his hand and became calmer. In the gym, 1623 came across several corpses with holes in their abdomens, filled with spider silk. Also found was a journal belonging to Aaron Fisher. A skittering sound was heard, followed by the bang of something metallic falling over. D-1623 ran to a supply room and hid in a pile of sports equipment. When the Tsar asked for a visual on what was making the noise, 1623 answered, Aaron Fisher. Wooden creaking came next, followed by loud footsteps and clicking noises. D-1623's breathing accelerated. The microphone picked up an unexpected sound. Sniffling. Then, metal scraping against the floor. D-1623 held her breath. The last communication Nassau received before the feet cut was a cacophony of tearing metal, gunshots, and screaming. A retrieval team later found the journal discovered by D-1623, but not her body. A brief reading revealed it was written by Aaron Fisher, at the guidance of his therapist. The pages were filled with thoughts of suspicion regarding other students. He was convinced the pair in the library had been laughing at him, his really lanky arms and stupid giant head. How am I supposed to believe that anyone here really wants to be my friend when they're clearly lying straight to my face, he wrote. How am I supposed to trust when no trust is being given to me? In the course of the writing... Three other points of interest came up amid a constant belief that other students were secretly against him. A school play he was interested in, a consistent discovery of spiders in the school and around his belongings, and the arrival of a new student teacher, Mr. Nassar, in science class. Aaron's suspicions of his peers increased as he joined the school play. What he thought would help him to become more accepted only seemed to be a new opportunity to be laughed at. And over and over... He'd see the spiders, which none of the other kids were seeing. Hints of a desire or even a plot for retribution against perceived bullies began to emerge. After these discoveries, researcher Nassar was ordered from higher-ups to investigate the school gym personally, in the belief that his familiarity to Fisher would allow unique insight on the anomaly. Nassar's first major visual concerned the small event stage in the gym. The body of Aaron Fisher, hanging above from a noose. Researcher Nassar expressed feelings of guilt over not having done enough to help Fisher in his time at the school. Noises off camera made him turn. He noticed something, jumped off stage, and proceeded to the center of the gym. Several nooses descended from the ceiling, catching Nassar off guard. They wrapped around his limbs and hoisted him upward. An arachnoid entity emerged from beneath the floor. 
large, approximately 4 meters in width and 10 meters in length. At the back of its abdomen, a long appendage comprised of seared, segmented flesh was visible, resembling the body of a common earthworm. Each segment was comprised of several human faces, including that of Leah Freeman, Deanne Hedge, Alan Brown, and D1623. All faces appeared at rest, eyes closed. The creature's head was also human in appearance, its face disheveled and gaunt. The eyes had sunken and the cheekbones were visible, suggesting malnutrition. From its neck hung a noose, the rope severed. The SAR didn't need facial recognition software to identify this as Aaron Fisher. I remember you, Aaron said. You were one of the teacher's helpers, I think. Nassar confirmed his identity, then offered more. He had been a student of the school at two stages in life, a student teacher and a pupil like Fisher. After a moment of silence, Fisher asked if he could tell him something. Nassar agreed. I hate them, Aaron said. I've always hated them. Ever since they started laughing at me behind my back, and especially since that stupid prank on me at rehearsal. I showed them, though. I got to hear them all get scared and attacked and dead. As Fisher had spoken, Nassar had averted his gaze. Fisher commanded him to lock eyes, his neck now extending several feet from the body to meet the researcher. Fisher's expression was a mix of anger and pain. He stared at Nassar for a long, heavy moment as if searching for something. At last, he seemed to find it. The faces on Fisher's abdomen changed, expressing melancholy. Fisher himself withdrew his neck and sank to the ground, beginning to cry. In a fit of frustration, he shouted at the floor, demanding to know why everyone hated him. I don't hate you, and neither did they, Nassar answered. You just had a lot of strong emotions. A lot of feelings. Everyone has those, Aaron. Nobody hates you. Fisher expressed that he just wanted them to feel how he felt. They had no idea what it felt like to be him. But now they did, and he wasn't sorry. They did it to themselves, he swore. And yet, Fisher's expression betrayed pain. The faces on his body began to shed tears and express his hurt as he repeated that it wasn't his fault. I know it wasn't your fault, Aaron, Nassar said. You just did what you felt was best at the time. You're allowed to feel that way, to act out if you want to, but there are other methods we can use to help you feel better. He pointed to the cadaver hung from the stage. There is something I can do for you. Trust me. I'll take care of you now. I wasn't there for you before, but I can be there for you now. Through his tears, Fisher looked up at Nassar. Are you mad? Not at all, Nassar answered. I promise. Following this event, the body of Aaron Fisher was removed from the rafters and cremated. Researcher Nassar accompanied the task force to the nearby Meadowlands where Fisher's ashes were spread, causing an immediate end to all anomalous activity within Washington Middle School. According to the Foundation Brief, efforts to rebuild the school are underway, and SCP-6305 can now be considered neutralized. And it is with this that we must, at last, say goodnight to the Ghostwriter Manuscripts. It has been an excellent couple of haunting hours, though, hasn't it? Before we conclude our unexpected additional visit this evening, a quick heads up. Pre-orders for my very first vinyl figure are still open, though time is growing very short now. We're celebrating nine years of October on Nightmind with this limited run exclusive until October 29th, and it will only go into production if 500 pre-orders are secured. So if you have any interest, your pre-order helps everyone who wants one receive a figure. And with no cap to the production amount, once 500 or more are secured, you get one, period. Sales of this final figure help me out a lot. It secures the time and resources I need to empower the next phase of content on the channel while supporting the vision of no longer having to rely on sponsors. 
If you've enjoyed the SCP Vault series, or Nightmind in general, please consider picking one up. The link is on screen and in the video description. Thank you for listening and pre-ordering if you do. Secondly, those who know October on Nightmind know there's always more to enjoy in the month. While our time over here may be short under current circumstances, festivities may continue in more interesting ways. I urge you to take a look at my Twitter account to know more, seen on screen here. The link is also in the video description. I appreciate you sticking around for those two announcements, and for coming by for an unexpected part two. As always, thanks to the authors and contributors to the SCP articles featured. Thank you for listening, and major thanks to all my supporters on Patreon, who empower my ability to keep doing Nightmind and the Nightmind Index for new and undiscovered unfiction projects. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and I'll be seeing you again real soon for more October fun. Until next time, sleep tight.